I like that, Brother Milton. I'm from the west side. Y'all going to get a message from the west side. Y'all going to see what it's like when we preach in the west side this morning. You know, when we were worshiping, I heard in my spirit that if you will dare to take on things that are bigger than you, then you'll see how big God is. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now this morning, if I may say so myself. And I, I've been up here before. I mean, I've been up here on Wednesday nights, and, and that was a stretch to it at the time. And I've been up here taking up tithes and offerings, and y'all may think that, you know, I've had a lot of people encourage me, and that means a lot to me, but I get nervous up here, to tell you the truth. I do. And I get nervous in the openings. I opened for six months uh, for the services. And I told Caitlin after six months, it was like, it was like day one still. Like, I still was like, you know. And I think it's, it's really because of how serious I take this. And if I'm careful, which this is what I don't want to do, I can easily compare myself. And I look at Pastor Eddie, and I'm like, oh, man, like, I can't fill those shoes. And, in fact, the first time Pastor asked me to preach, Caitlin and I had been married, I think, just about a year or so. And he said... David, I, I cut up with this and tell Pastor Eddie this story, and he gets a kick out of it. He said, David, i got to get you up there. And it was so funny when he said that I knew what that meant, but I played stupid. In my mind, I'm going, up where? Like, uh-uh. You know, and I, you know, I never preached in a church, y'all. I never was a youth leader. I never ministered to anybody till I got here. And, uh, and, he, and he began to tell me, you know, I want to get you up there and gave me on a Wednesday night. And it was like a month in advance. I'm sweating it for four weeks. Just like, whew. you know, it's like a kid when you go to the dentist office and you're just like, I want to go first. No, I don't. I want to go last. I want to go first. I want to go away. I want to go last. And then it was like the Lord began to, you know, speak to me because he knew what I was dealing with in my heart. I was comparing myself to Pastor Eddie, to Brother Milton, to, uh, to you know, to Josh and just seeing the way they minister and just thinking, I'm not like that. You know, I'm not like that. It, it's, it ain't going to be that way. Well, the Lord began to tell me, he said, listen, if, I, if Pastor Eddie, if I wanted him up there, he'd be up there at this time. If I wanted Brother Milton up there, he'd be up there. If I wanted, you know, Josh, he'd be up there. He says, you're up there because I've called you to be up there. And it was, it was the weirdest thing. It was like suddenly the nervousness turned into boldness and excitement. And so I heard that while we were praising that if you will dare to take on something that's bigger than you, you'll see how big God is. In fact, the Lord reminded me this morning of something I hadn't thought about in a while. Before I met Caitlin, I was dating a girl that was ironically a preacher's daughter, but it was nothing. <laughs> I got a type, don't I? No. But there, it was nothing like this dynamic, and that's nothing to go against them, but it, it really wasn't. It's not like this, this dynamic here. But, um, and I was in a church service, and they had a special guest minister preaching. And he came over to me, and he said, uh, Son, do you read your Bible? And, you know, I'm a, a baby Christian, and, you know, at this point, I just, you know, you know, came back to the Lord after living, you know, a life of sin for years. And I'm sitting there, and in the blink of an eye, two, two roads came to me. I said, Well, I can lie and say, Yeah, you know, and kind of get up in the chair like that and look really good in front of all these people. Or I can tell the truth and humble myself, which I know is the right thing, and I'm not going to look good in front of all these people. Well, thank God I had the, 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 you know, the common sense to choose the latter. And so I said, no, sir, I, not like I should be. And he said, well, you, you might want to start doing it. Or if I, he said, if I was you, I would, because one day you're going to need it. And then he went on to preaching, and I'm sitting there like, one day I'm going to need it. I was like, what does he mean by that? You know what I mean? And I'm thinking of all these wild things. I'm just sitting there, and I almost couldn't hear what he was saying for a while because I'm going, one day I'm going to need it. What, what does he mean one day I'm going to? Am I going to get, like, captured one day or something? And, and somebody's like, Romans 16, 20. And I'm, ha, 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 you know, and they're like, I, I, I don't know. And it's, you know, like, I'm thinking these weird things. What does he mean, like, one day I'm going to need it? Like, well, then after the service, the girl I was dating, I asked her, I said, you heard what he said to me, right? And she said, yeah. I said, what? Well, what did he mean by that? Well, one day I'm going to need it. And, you know, and she was like, well, I don't know, maybe one day you're going to be preaching or something like that. And, you know, and I'm thinking something wild and crazy. And when she said something that actually made sense, I went, ah, yeah, yeah, right, me preaching? Well, here I am. So here I am. And so it just, it, just, it, it, it amazes me just, you know, how the Lord sees things. And I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that I'd have been up here 
doing what I'm doing this morning. All righty. Well, what I want to preach on this morning to you guys is called, What's in Your Thoughts? And it sounds a lot like the Capital One credit card commercials. Have y'all seen those? What's in your wallet? And, uh, you know, that's a question that I think a lot of people are more concerned with rather than what's in their thoughts. But really the better question is what's in your thoughts? Because we've been educated enough to know, and I'm going to, you know, go through this today and show you in case you don't, that what's in your thoughts can affect what's in your wallet. Isn't that right? If, if you would, Miss Marilyn, pull up, um, pull up Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And I was reading online, there was a study conducted in 2020 that said the average person thinks uh, more than 6,000 thoughts per day. And when I read that, I was a little blown away. I was like, wow, it's like 6,000 thoughts. You know, and I knew that it would be a large number, but I didn't think something like that. And it, and it just, it amazed me because I thought, here's this large number, 6,000, but each individual one is so significant and so important. You know, the thoughts that we think are powerful and they play such a big part of our lives and who we are. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I'm going to get my Pastor Eddie on, and you'll see what I mean by that, in telling you that that word imagination in the original Hebrew is yetzer, yetzer. I wrote down the pronunciation to help me. I can't remember how it's spelled, but in the pronunciation, it's Y-A-Y-T-S-E-R, just yetzer, and it means mind and frame. So when you put that together, you get mind frame. And when I read that, I thought about a picture frame. And what does a picture frame do? It, it holds an image, right? Well, our mind frame, our thoughts, hold an image. And see, a person's life will be formed to the image that their mind frame holds. In fact, the way that we act and, 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 and who we are as a person will be influenced by that image that our mind frame holds. You know, we see it in this scripture right here. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great. Well, the reason that the wickedness of man was great was because their mind frame, their imagination, it said, was on evil continually. So that means the image their mind frame held was evil. Things that were evil, evil acts, evil deeds, you know, evil sayings, just anything that did, was not of God, that didn't please God, that was all their imagination held, and so that was all they could produce. And so it, it, that's why it's so important that when we, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when, when we get saved, we've got to get a new mind. Because it's not just about like, well, don't think on those things. Those are bad things. No, it's about we, you know, in order for someone to live this life that God has laid out, we're going to have to begin to think different. Amen. We can't think the way that we thought. We can't, we can't expect to live a different life if our thoughts stay the same. Right. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, a person will take on the identity of the thoughts they think continually. Yeah. I'm going to say that again. A person will take on the identity of the thoughts they think continually. Now, I want to explain that. If a person thinks a thought of not having enough continually, yeah. it will cause them to withhold when it comes to giving. Right. And then that person will be known as a stingy person. Right. So literally that thought of not having enough which is a fearful thought, but it's also a selfish thought because it's a thought that you put you over everybody else. It's, also, it's a fearful thought because it's a thought that doesn't trust God. That thought will cause you to act in a way of withholding, and then people would know you as a stingy person, describe you as a stingy person or someone like that. Another one is, you know, has anybody ever known someone that you would say, that, that's a per that person's stressed out. They're stressed out all the time. Maybe somebody you work with, a boss. Well, the reason for that is because that person continually thinks on things that induce stress. Yeah. Their mind frame is centered around an image that's constantly a stressful image. And so it makes them that kind of person. You know, Pastor Eddie has often said, whatever you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. Yeah. 
And I got to thinking about when you're driving a car, and I've done this, I'm guilty of this, and you're maybe somewhere you've never been, and you're kind of looking around, you're doing this. Well, something kind of grabs your attention. If you're not careful, the car begins to go off the road. Well, what direction does the car tend to go in? The direction that you're looking, right? And see, that's how people's lives are. They will begin to steer their lives in the direction of their most dominant thought. Amen? The thought that they think on the most. That, you know, they will begin to steer that way. And see, thoughts are like seeds. You know, Brother Milton was preaching and he was talking about, you know, when you sow a seed, you ought to expect a harvest. Well, see, our thoughts are seeds. And, when, and the thoughts that we think on, like a seed, are going to produce their equivalent. Amen? That's why I was saying earlier that when you get saved, you need a new mind. A new man needs a new mind. It ain't just about, don't think about those things. That's, you know, like, a, like in an unclean way, it's like that you literally are to live a new life. And if you're going to live a new life, then you've got to think new thoughts. You've got to think differently. Amen? Pull up uh, Romans 12, 2, if you would, for me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and perfect and the will of God. You know, I was listening to Josh preach a couple Wednesdays ago when we had the youth party, and uh, he got on this, this uh, scripture here, and he said, That word renewing means renovation. And I perked up in my chair. I was working at home. Me and Caitlin was working... The next day we were listening, and I perked up because I had been studying the exact same thing. And I didn't know that Josh was preaching that that Wednesday. I, hadn't, I actually didn't even know he was preaching that Wednesday, to be honest. And here I'm studying something that he's studying too. And I just thought that was so amazing that, you know, and actually I was kind of proud. And I was kind of like, shoot, you know, because I was proud when I found that discovery. I'm looking in the Word, and I see that, and I click on, I got my little concordance on my Bible, and I click on that word renewing, and it's showing me the original Greek and what it means, and it says renovation. And I was like, man, that's awesome. And I just started getting all these images. And I was like, I can't wait to share that with the congregation when I preach. And then Josh beat me to it, and I was like, rats. You know, it's like, but, you know, the Bible says the last shall be first. So if we're going to go by the Bible, you heard it from me first. Uh, I don't know if Josh is watching, but we have a little competition sometimes where it all started when I was up here on a pastor's appreciation, and I was talking about Caitlin and I weren't married yet. And I was just talking about how amazed I was by this family that, you know, Caitlin and I are just dating. I don't even know if we were engaged at this point. And that they treated me the same way like they treated Josh, someone they knew as a kid who's been married to Rebecca and been in the family for a long time. And just, you know, that it's not like, well, Josh, we know him, but you're the new boyfriend. You know, you got it. It wasn't like that. I went on the vacations and got to, and I was just so amazed by that. And then when Josh got up to preach, I believe it was Pastor Appreciation, he said, he made some joke and was like, don't forget, I'm number one. I'll always be number one. And so we kind of have a little joke, so I don't know if he's watching, but uh, I claim number one on this one because the last shall be first. Amen? But that, that word renewing, it means renovation. And see, I don't know about you, but when I think about that word, I think about a house being renovated. And see, when a house is being renovated, old things are being torn out so that new things can be brought in. Nobody in their right mind, I got tickled by this because God knows I have a sense of humor. And when I'm studying, he just, it's almost like he just shows me funny things and I get tickled. Nobody in their right mind would say, hey, we've been renovating our house. We want you to come check it out. And you're like, oh, yeah, cool, yeah. And then you get there and you walk in and you're looking and you're like, the counters look the same and cabinets look the same and appliances look the same and they're couch looks the same, the flooring looks the same. I mean, the walls don't even look like they've been painted. What are they talking about? And they're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, what'd you, what do you think? And, you know, nobody in their right mind would do that, but what people do is they don't change the way they think, and they wonder why their life's not different. They wonder why they're not experiencing these things. They're coming in on Sunday and Wednesday and hearing the Word and getting excited and then going out and then going back into that default setting, that autopilot mode, so to say. The youth has heard me use that term autopilot. And they're wondering, why. Well, I just don't get it. I don't understand why things are this way. Well, have you thought about what you're thinking about? 
I know that sounds funny, but have you thought about what you're thinking about? Because, see, a lot of people get in this autopilot mode, and I've been guilty of this. You're just kind of going through the motions. It's work, you know, it's this, cook dinner, stuff around the house. We got church today. Let's go to church. It was great. Let's go. And you just get in these motions, and it's like your life's an autopilot, and then thoughts are coming and going and flowing, and you're really not paying attention to what you're thinking about. I mean, a person can run an autopilot in such a way that, the, that certain thoughts are kind of like um, the default, so to say. Like you can by default think about something that's negative. Right. And see, I, before I preached this message, I had a moment and I was working and the negative thoughts were kind of bombarding my mind for like a days and weeks and I was having conversations going back and forth and my fuse was short. I just, it was kind of like, you know, Brother Mark talking about the, the cloud and the little dog. I felt that way and, <laughs> and I mean, and I have much to be thankful for in my life. Right. And I'm sitting here acting like I'm just stressed and just... Well, then one day I thought about, you know, I'm just sitting there working, and I kind of, to myself, sort of complained like a baby. I was like, but Lord, you know, I have such a good imagination. Like I always have as a kid. Basically complaining, saying, when I picture something, it's so easy for me to make it real because I have such a good imagination. And it's so funny that immediately I heard a voice come back and say, well, use that for good. And I'm sitting there like, well, yeah. And it was amazing. Like, he didn't argue with me. He didn't beat me up. But it was just, use that for good. Because, see, God's given us an imagination. God's given us this, this mental framework, this mind frame that we have. And that these, you know, to be able to hold images in our mind. But, see, the enemy, we know, wants to take anything that God has intended for good and use it for evil. And so he'll show you images that don't line up with what God is showing you. In fact, you know, your thoughts are so powerful that the characteristics of your life can stay the same, but by changing your thoughts, you can experience something new. And I've had this. You know, I talked about a week where I'm thinking negative thoughts. I'm just arguing. You know, I could be listening to too much politics, and they're talking about gun control, and I'm making this debate in my head about how that's stupid. And, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm playing both sides. Like, here's the liberal, and then here's the conservative. And I'm just, you know, well, they're going to say this, and then I'm going to come back with this. And, and then I wonder why I'm on edge, and it's just like every little thing is like, you know, because I've been having arguments in my mind. You know, and I'm not a debater. I don't like debating anyways. It's just not part of my personality. But, you know, by simply changing my thoughts, it was like my life just began to change. It was like, you know, stress went away, heaviness went away. It was like suddenly I just, I kind of felt like myself. I kind of had like this, you know, my sense of humor and my, you know, little witty personality and, and, just, and just, you know, kind of hopping and skipping around the house. And it was like nothing changed. It wasn't like I got a raise at work or they promoted me. You know, and my job's great, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it wasn't like somebody brought a brand new car down the driveway. And it was because I decided to think differently. Suddenly, it was like the dynamic of my life started changing. And see, that's how powerful thoughts are. You know, in fact, your thoughts are so powerful that the characteristics of your life can change because you've decided to change the way that you think. Amen? You know, the Bible says that we've read that verse countless times, Romans 12, 2. And it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By getting a high-paying job, you know, by getting that thing you want, you know. Be transformed because you got a brand new car. Be trans, you know, no, be transformed because you got, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in your savings account or 20 or whatever, you know, whatever is a lot to you, you know, 50,000. No, that's not how we're transformed. But see, the devil plays this game where... He wants you to set the, the, the bar of the transformation of your life on the thing you don't have. Well, if I could just have that baby, oh, I'll be transformed. Or if I just, you know, if I just, you know, got this many followers on my social media account. I'm used to preaching to you. So, you know, if I got this many, you know, if I just, and it's just always on things, things, things. And it's, I like to call it the decoy game. Because he's showing you a decoy, like, oh, if you just get this, if you just get to this level, if you just obtain this, then you'll get that joy. And it's never anything about your thoughts, never. And that's really the, the factor where, you know, where it's held within. The joy that you're missing, the things that you're, it's all held within the thoughts, the thoughts that you have. It says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renovating of the mind leads to a new life. 
you know, people will not reach beyond the scope of the image of their imagination. Pastor Eddie's talked about people that live in poverty have a poverty mindset. Well, they, because they have that poverty mindset, because they have that, that mental image of poverty, they won't reach for nothing else because they view everything outside of that scope as impossible or unreachable or that's just not who I am. I can't get that. I don't. But we have to change that. Amen? I didn't think this was who I was up here in front of y'all this morning. I mean, you're looking at a guy who in high school, not even as a kid in high school, would take zeros. I, when Pastor Eddie says that, it's like, man, I was the same person. Would take zeros, did not get up in front of the class. Or when I was forced to, and I'm holding the paper, you would hear the ch I'm serious. You know, and then I could feel my face turning beet red, which was the worst because then it's like, oh, now I know that they know that they're seeing my red face and I can't hide the fact that I'm nervous in and, and high school. And yet, because I've chose to think differently, I can do this. In fact, thoughts for this right here tried to come on me. You know, at first I was like, ah, I got this, you know. Glory to God, I got this, I can do this. You know, that's because I had a month, you know. Ooh, it's way back. But then the week started closing in. I'm going, ah, this is real. I've never been up there on a Sunday morning, you know. And it's been probably over a year since I've been up on a Wednesday. Oh, man. You know, I was like, whew, whew. And then I started selling myself short. Well, well, I'm working on this as a student. I'm a student of what I'm about to teach. Surely I shouldn't be up there teaching that because I'm a student. And I kind of started getting down on myself. But then the Lord reassured me. He said, you don't have to be an expert or a master of something to teach on it. You just got to be doing it. You got to be practicing it. You got to be applying it. And I am. And I am. And so in the weeks leading up to this, I've just been saying, I can do this. The Lord is with me. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my boldness. In fact, I was sitting in Pastor Alley's office, and I was just building myself up like the Lord is my boldness. I am bold. When I get up, Jesus, you said you would never leave me nor forsake me. So as I stand before the people, I just saw two people standing up. And I got somebody with me. I've got help. Yeah. Praise God. And, but it had, again, it's like it's all tied in. It's my thoughts. Because I could have gotten defeated before coming up here because of the thoughts I've chose to think. And so this isn't about me, and I don't want to make it about me, but what kind of thoughts are you thinking? Are you thinking? If you had to be honest, what's the image of the thoughts that you're holding? How is it holding you back? You know, we had a computer, many of them when I was growing up as a kid, like a family computer. And it seemed like after no time at all, they would just get, you know, real slow and you couldn't do anything on them. Well, my dad would do what's called reformatting it which if you don't know what that means, basically he'd put this disc in that came with it and he would restore the computer back to the condition that it was in when we bought it. And so when I thought about that, I thought a lot of Christians are like that. They get bogged down with all this junk and then they just feel heavy and running slow and just all this. And you need to reform that. You need to begin to take inventory of your thoughts. What sort of thoughts am I thinking about? Think about what you're thinking about. Tomorrow, Monday morning, when you're at work, Start thinking about what you're thinking about. I know that sounds silly, but I, the Lord's really dealt with me on this. You know, instead of having thoughts, the next thing you know, you've been thinking on something stupid for 45 minutes, and you're like, oh, yeah, I guess I should. No, be, be attentive. Be aware of what you're thinking about. Amen? Pull up, uh, if you would, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and we're going to read 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thought thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. I want you to pay attention to that verse 4 where it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold? I think it's important that we know what that is because that's what the weapons we have are designed to take down. We don't have fleshly weapons. Thank God we don't have fleshly weapons. You know, because our fight's not in the flesh. And see, that's another tactic of the enemy. He wants to make you think that the reason you're stressed out is because you've got a boss that treats you this way or because, you know... 
you don't make the kind of money that you wish you could make, and if you would just up it, then life would be perfect. And it's all these carnal things, it's all these natural things, that there's nothing wrong with. It's great to have good bosses. It's great to make good money. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not going to be where the peace lies. The peace lies is you've got to begin to clean up the mind. You've got to begin to take authority over your thoughts and the mind that you're thinking and stop letting the devil run ragged over you. And so strongholds are anything that opposes God and His will and His way for your life. It could be like a deep-rooted belief system, anything of that nature that's, that just opposes what God has for your life. And see, that's why if you notice in verse 5... It talks about uh, taking every thought captivity into the obedience of Christ. The reason you have to do that is because the seed of a wrong thought meditated on begins to grow roots. And then strongholds begin to form. And then that's when people begin to get into this default mode of something because they've built that stronghold. They've allowed that stronghold to be raised up. Listen to this. I, I love this. I read this in my Bible. I wish I could tell you I came up with it, but I didn't. It says, behind every stronghold is a lie. Behind every lie is a fear. Behind every fear is an idol. And I read, when I read that, it hit me. I was like, man, we've been seeing that. You know, when COVID was going on, I almost hate to even bring that up, but when COVID was going on, there was a lie that was pushed. If you get it, you're going to die. And then there's the ticker. T -t -t -t. You know, if you get it, you're going to be part of the ticker. Tick, tick. And then people believe this lie. If I get it, I'm going to die. If I get it, I'm going to die. If I get it, I'm... And then now fear started to come in. And then what happened because of the fear, they began to turn to anything other than God. And I'm talking saved people. Of course, lost people aren't going to... Lost people need to get safer. I'm talking born-again Christians begin to put faith in... Let me, get, let me cover my face and... And let me get the, booth, the, the shot and then the second booster and the booster to the booster and the booster to the booster to the booster to the booster. To the booster and, just, you know, and then that was, and it was because, idle, idle. And, and, and I don't want anybody to feel bad. If you wore a mask, and that, that don't, I'm not condemning anybody. And if you've got the vaccine, I'm not condemning. But what I'm saying is people begin to hold that in the place of God. The vaccine became God. You know what I mean? The mask became God because that, you know, because we, a lie was meditated on so much. Instead of meditating on, you know, by his stripes I was healed. He himself bore my sicknesses, carried my sorrows, and by his stripes I was healed. Instead of meditating on uh, Psalm 91 where it says, And no evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come nigh my dwelling. That means if I get near the plague, it's got to die. It can't get on me. It can't exist anywhere on me. Instead of meditating on that, people meditated on the, on the wrong thing and it caused them to get in fear and then an idol was raised up that wasn't God as the healer and as the protector. You know, we've seen it. It could easily happen with, we know gas prices are getting high. And people can think, oh, if, if gas gets too much higher, I, I just won't be able to fill up my car. You know, I, I won't be able to go anywhere. I'm just going to have to stay at home. I won't be able to get to work. What if they fire me because I can't go to work? What if I can't get to the grocery store and buy because I just, you know, and just worry. worry. And the next thing you know, now because you've focused on this thought of gas getting high, gas getting high, la, la, now you begin to get in fear. And now instead of making God your source, money is your source. And I'm like, ah, you know, the guest minister, you know, God's saying this, uh, a little, you, know, you, know, a little, you know, withholding more than I should because of fear, idle, serving mammon instead of God. And it all is, it, it's, it's all down to the thoughts. It ain't because, well, if I just made more money, then I could afford the gas. No, you'd find something else to worry about. If that's why you would. There'd be something else that just ain't quite right. But it's, here's the thing. God will supply. He said, and I believe it's Matthew chapter 7, when he talks about the birds, they neither sow nor reap, yet your heavenly Father provides for them. I've had to go to this scripture, y'all. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've had to really... And, and just really get this on the inside of me. And that they neither sow nor reap, yet your heavenly Father provides for them. How much more does He love you for the bird, than the birds of the air? And the Lord knows the things that we have need of. He's not up there just like, just all about, well, raise your hands and, and do this and just, and, and just oblivious to everything. No, He knows the thing. He knows you need gas in your car. He knows that you got to have money in your bank account to pay for, because we live in an economic world. He knows that. And see, he'll see to it that you have the things that you need. This is the mind frame that you need to take on. 
Instead of thinking, you know, of not having enough and, and getting sucked dry, you need to think about, well, I don't care how high gas gets. I don't care, you know, what the government does. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I'm not of this economy. I'm of another economy. Now, if someone's not saved in this economy, then get saved. If you don't get saved, then I guess you're going to worry because that's about all you can do. But see, we're of another kingdom. We have another economy that we're tied to. Amen? I'm telling you, Pastor Eddie, I, you know, I've been focusing so much on today, and I told Caitlin that once I preach today, I'm going back to about four Sundays ago, or however many when Pastor Eddie talked about the wealth of the wicked being laid up for the just, and he went through all this. And man, I was just like eating it up. And I was just like, oh, I need this. Oh, I need this. And I was getting so excited. Excuse me. But I'm just so thankful that we have pastors that hear from God. Because I don't know if anybody else needed to hear that message. I needed to hear that message. And that's why I feel weird, you know, the Lord had to reassure me, like, why am I getting up there, Lord, and preaching on thoughts when I've had some pretty sorry ones for about a month? And he's like, well, <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You know, and I tell the youth, you know, you know I tell the youth, I say, listen, just because Caitlin and I and the other leaders, just because we're youth leaders, we're not immune to this. We're not up here on this other level preaching to you and telling you to do this. And we've got, we've got, we're working on it. We have weeks where we don't spend time with God. And we're talking to y'all about spending time with God. And, you know, we're moving house or something. And we don't spend time with God like we ought to. And I remember preaching to them about the week that we moved from Page on to Jefferson. It was like we moved and then literally, I think it was for seven days after work, we would take this room. We would take that room. We would take this. And thank God for it. I'm not complaining. But my time with God, and, you know, I didn't make the sacrifice I should have by getting up earlier or going to bed later, started getting hit. And by the end of the week, it was like a frail man, like, oh, I need the presence of God. Like I've, and I told the youth that. I said, because I know the difference, and I could feel it. And so, you know, I stand up here as someone who is doing this. So don't think that I'm up here preaching to you and you know, I'm, you know, that I've got this perfected. I'm working on it. Amen. I'm working on it. I'm doing exactly. That's why I'm excited. I hope you can hear it in my voice because I'm working on it. God's showing me things. You know, the renovation of the mind. I've been more purposeful with my mind. I'm thinking about, thinking more about what I'm thinking about. You know, amen. amen. But back to the strongholds. The purpose of the stronghold is to get you to believe a lie so that you'll give place to fear so that you'll turn to anything that isn't God to be your source. Well, we have weapons for that. What's the weapons? We've got the blood of Jesus. We begin to plead the blood of Jesus against fear. Amen. We've got the sword of the Spirit. You know, I preach to the youth about don't get overwhelmed, you know, you know, with the Word and you look at it and you're just like, where do I go? Where do I start? And so you don't do nothing. Get one verse. One verse. I told them, I said, we have this thing called Google. Use it for your good. You could Google scriptures on low self-esteem. Google scriptures on, um, you know, whatever it is you're dealing with. You know, you know, sickness, scriptures on healing, scriptures on provision. And get, and read them. And then when you find that one that just hits you, write it down. Put it on a sticky note, do something. I told, I, I don't know if the guys would really do this, but the girls probably have the makeup mirrors. Put it on the makeup mirror. And then as you're getting you know, ready, you see it and quote it. Say it until you don't need it anymore. You don't need the sticky note. And just, you know, and just, I told him, I said, it's like swinging that sword. You're just taking that sword and you're swinging it. And the enemy's going, whoa, whoa, you know, and he's sitting here doing it because you're, versus letting him run roughshod over you. Amen? Right. We, have, we have weapons. We have weapons for these strongholds. Don't let the devil run ragged over your mind. Verse 5. I want to go back to verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. It says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I, I, that's exactly what I was saying earlier. These things that come in your head, these conversations, these arguments that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Well, if, I don't have, if, if gas gets too much higher, I won't be able to afford it. That's an argument that goes against the knowledge of God. Amen. That goes against my God shall supply all your need. And so you've got to choose which one am I going to believe. Am I going to believe the Word of God or am I going to believe the argument that goes against the Word of God? Which one am I going to believe? And it says bringing every thought into captivity. This is something you do on purpose. Into the obedience of Christ. Philippians 4.8, if you would, Miss Marilyn, in the Passion, please. Philippians 4.8 in the Passion. We can demolish 
every deceptive fantasy. I want to show you guys something. Philippians 4, 8 in the Passion. It says, so keep your thoughts continually, continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts in every glorious work of God, praising Him always. That's a checklist right there. When I read that, it was like I heard the Holy Spirit say, that's a checklist for your thoughts. When you have a thought and you're thinking about what you're thinking about, see if it checks the box. See if it checks one, see if it checks all, that's good. If it doesn't check any boxes, take it captive. And I love what it says at the end. It says, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Don't forget how the Lord has brought you through. A lot of people say, well, forget the past, forget the past. And, that, and that's true to a degree, to forget the past. But don't forget about how God has brought you through. Right. Don't forget about the times that God's healed you. Yeah. Don't forget about the times how God's made a way when it seemed like there was no way. Right. You know, I remember the, the, the movies. I hadn't seen one of my Men in Black. And I always think about that little device they use, that little stick, and it goes, Psh, and they just wipe your memory. <laughs> and I think that's a, a tactic that the devil likes to use. You face an impossibility, and God brings you through, and then the next impossibility, it's like, Psh, oh, what am I going to do? And it's like, how about the same thing as last time? <laughs> and, it's like, and I've had to say, how about the same thing as last time? And so remember these things. Praise God. If anything, that would at least build you up that you're sitting there praising God. And God will come in the midst of where you are because He inhabits the praises of His people. But look at the beginning of that verse. It says, Keep your thoughts fixed, continually fixed, on all that is authentic and real. I thought of an analogy that I heard a long time ago, and I loved it. It was, um, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of Phil and Fern Halverson. They were mighty uh, prayer intercessors, and I, they've gone on to be with the Lord. And... Uh, Fern, she used this uh, analogy. And like, have you ever watched like a war movie or an action movie that has these really high intense scenes? You know, like in the war movies, you know, it has the scenes of the war and, you know, guys are losing limbs and body parts. And maybe in the action movie, there's fighting scenes and, you're, and it's showing you these things. And it's like, we know that they're fake. In fact, in fact when we went to Hilton Head a couple, a couple weeks ago for our, our anniversary, Y'all know me. I'm a gun guy. Man, I like guns. And so I was flipping through the TV, and I saw where John Wick was coming on. And uh, I, I like, I know, okay, I know realistically John Wick is not re super realistic. It's kind of flashy, but that's why I like it. That's why I watch. And so I'm watching Count Reese. He's flipping that jacket and doing all the, and flipping the mags. And, and I just love it. I'm like, yeah. You know, and he's doing the, and then in the fighting scenes, that's my favorite part of the action scenes. You know, guys are getting beat up, and there's limbs getting... And I'm going, mm, ah, ooh, ooh, ah. And I had a thought. I was like, I bet Caitlin's in the next room of this little beach condo we're in, like, going, what in the world is he doing? Like, you know, she's like, mm, ah, mm. But my point to all of this is I know it's fake. I know it's fake. I know it's Hollywood. And, and I used to get a kick when I was a kid. I'd watch a movie, and somebody died in it, and then you see him, like, on... Well, they used to have Regis and Kathy Lee back in the day. Now... It, and then you'd be like, well, I thought they were dead. And it's like, son, that's fake. It's not real. But they died. I've seen it. And like, no, son, it's, it's, a, it's a movie. It's not, oh, you know. It's a, and so, yeah, but we, so, you know, we know that it's fake. But yet it can still get a response out of us. And see, that's what the enemy will do. He'll show you an image and your thoughts and your mind frame. And it's fake. It's a total fake. It's a lie. Because he's the father of lies. But he wants to get you to squirm at it, and, mm, ah, uh, you know, and, get, and, and, to, and to get a reaction out of you so that you'll begin to get moved by that rather than what God says, you know. And see, with anything that's a fake, how do you identify it as a fake? You got to compare it to something that's real. You know, if, if there's coins or any type of money or memorabilia, and they want to know if it's a replica or, or the authentic. they got to find one they know is real and see how it matches. Well, the Word of God, this is authentic. Amen. This is real. This is authentic as it gets. This is as truthful as it gets, absolute truth. And so we've got to mirror it, the thought, the image we have. Even if it's just an image, we've got to mirror it to the image that that gives us. And then if it's a fake, 
then we know it's a fake. And we need to treat it like the movies and be like, oh, that's not real. You know what I mean? And no, ah, oh, you, ain't, you ain't coming. You ain't bringing. Gas getting too high. Well, guess what? The Lord is my shepherd. And I don't think his sheep are going to starve. I don't think the Lord's walking around with his staff with a bunch of homely, skinny-looking sheep, mangy and nasty looking. I think they look good. I think they're fed. I think they love their shepherd. Amen? And that's how we are. We're not lacking. I love what Brother Mark said. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. He said, I don't lack finances. Don't be afraid to say that. Don't think, well, I'm, am I making money, my God? No. Well, just know that whatever God asks you to give, give it. Then you know money's not your God. Amen? Be like, well, Lord, I don't care if it's $100 or, or $10,000. You know, I'll sow it if you tell me to. Amen. Then you'll know you're serving God. But don't, don't act like it's... Let's not get to the point where we say, I don't like for finances. Oh, I hope I'm not chasing money too much. No. You'll know if you're chasing money. First of all, you won't be quoting the scripture. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be, when pastor goes to talking about tithing and giving, you'll be like, mm, is he moving on something else? Yeah, you okay with it? There's an indicator. Amen? But see, I love that he said that because that's it right there. Because when gas prices, man, oh, man, what if it gets us? $7 a gallon here in South Carolina. Well, my God shall supply all of my need. Amen? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. I shall never lack in finances. I don't care what bill it is. I don't care what they ask for it. God will make a way. And I trust him to do so. Amen? And see, that's what we got to do. we got to begin to compare. you got to begin to take authority over your mind. You have authority over your thoughts. We have authority over the thoughts that we think. Everybody of every age in this room, I don't care if you're 12 years old or over 80, you have authority over your thoughts. It's going to take some work. You know, just like a garden, if you leave a garden unattended, what happens? Weeds sprout up and begins to choke out the, the things that you've planted. Well, that's what happens when we leave our minds unattended, the autopilot. Weeds start sprouting up. You know, we start getting these thoughts, and we're not thinking. We're just going through the motions of day to day. You know, and we got to rip out these seeds. we got to start. I'm telling you, get home and start thinking, okay, what have I been thinking about? And, you know, and, if, you know, and then as your day-to-day -day goes by, say, Lord, help me. Wait, illuminate my thoughts, Lord. Just when things come, it just, and when you, and it's like a, like a, like a, a radar detector. You know, you got the word coming through. Okay, that's good. Okay, everything's good. You know, man, you know, things sure are getting tight. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, yeah, okay, choo. And then, you know, make that change. I revoke that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Second Corinthians 10, 5 at the end. It says, bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. That word obedience in the original Greek means compliant submission. Compliant submission. So I think about, you know, MMA or UFC or whatever. I don't really, you know, watch those things, but I know about them. They'll put, those guys will have submission moves that they put the other guy in to get him to tap. And see, that's what we've got to do. We've got to bring things into the obedience of Christ. This is our responsibility when it comes to our minds. Amen? And so when that thought comes in, you know, of sickness and disease or lack or depression or I don't know if I'll ever be happy again, you know, just like a lo you lost a loved one and you just have thoughts like, well, I don't think I'll ever be as happy. You know, beep, 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 beep. says who? Right. Says who? And, and, and I don't know if that's for anybody because I didn't, I didn't even plan that, but it just rose up. But, you know, and I don't want to discredit, you know, the, the hardship of losing somebody that you love. But, you know, is, you think that's something that God's going to say to you, that because, you know, someone that you love goes on to be with the Lord that you'll never? No. So that's a thought right there. The beep, 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 and you say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. And so if something's attacking my joy, it's really attacking my strength. It's trying to make me weak. And so that's what you've got to do, and you've got to put it into submission. You've got to say, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God has given me his perfect joy. He has given me his perfect peace. If he's given it to me, I take it. I lay claim to it. It's mine. See, it is yours literally as if you wrote your name on it. I don't know if y'all did this, but when I was a kid, I went through this phase. I don't know what you call it. Where I was very territorial over what was mine. And so I get this PlayStation. This is the original PlayStation. And so I go in there and I, David's PlayStation. It's so stupid. I don't know why. But I did it. And like I wanted it to be, and that's David's PlayStation. I got it. You could play it. You know, my brother's name's Steven. You could play it, Steven, if you ask me. 
And I say, yes, you could play it, but that's, de- you know, and, that, and it's silly, but that's how you've got to take the promises of God. That's my promise. You know, apostrophe S, minds, <laughs> minds promise. Amen. And so that's what you have to do. Take, don't just say, yeah, it's in the Bible. I know, you know. It's for, uh, no, it's for me. It's for me. That's, that, that, his perfect joy is mine. He's given it to me to the point that I say that my joy is his joy. His joy is my joy. They're the same because they're one and the same. And begin to take things into that compliant submission. You know, be the gatekeeper of your mind. When you go see a sporting event or when you go see like a movie, they got somebody there t- look, looking at tickets, right? And that's because they want to make sure you've got the right to be there. Well, that's how you need to guard your mind and your thoughts. And I'm speaking to me as well because this is good. I like this. And you've got to stand there and you've got to look and, you know, the proof of the tickets, the word, yeah, that matches, that matches. matches. Whoa, yeah, I don't think so. No, no, no. And if it gets a little fight, then fight. You know how to fight. You think just because I push through, well, I'm supposed to be here. Like, you know, well, okay, if you say so, you know. You think they're going to let me do it? No. They'll call security. They'll do whatever they got to do because you're not getting in if you don't have that proof. And that's now how you need to treat the thoughts. The thoughts that come against you that don't line up with it. Take authority over it. Don't back down. Don't let it be, well, I tried and he bucked back. And well, what'd you do? Uh, I gave up. You didn't buck, buck back, buck his buck. You know what I mean? We'll buck all night, Satan. Somebody, I'll buck all night. You know, We'll see who's the taller one here. Amen. Because I'm taller than Satan. I am. Amen. And so you have to take authority over your thoughts, over your mind and over the thoughts that you think. You have to. You have to. I'm telling you, you absolutely have to if you want to live the life that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pull up. You guys are going to be getting out early today. Hallelujah. I was going to say that in the beginning of my message, but I had this thought like the youth are going to be like, yeah, right. (laughs) Because I feel like I'm always one that preaches the longest. It's just the way it works out. but. But anyway... So pull up, if you would, um, Isaiah 26.3. Isaiah 26.3. And any translation is fine. It says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts thee. You know, there's a scripture. There's a scripture in, oh man, is it Philippians? Not, Phil, not Philippians. It's Psalms, Psalms 40. It's somewhere. And, I was looking at, and it says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. And I had been reading that. I was like, blessed is... So blessed is the man, and the requirement is that he makes the Lord his trust. And so I would begin to focus on that scripture. I thought, well, if I make something my trust, that means it takes priority in my mind. Like if a person places their trust in money, that's, that's the king of their life. Right there, of whoa, I got to do whatever's going to keep the money. You know what I mean? It's a, you know, if, if people are worried about sickness and disease, then they're going to make, you know, crazy decisions like, oh, I'm not going out in public. Yeah. They got germs. You know, so like people are going to do, people are going to do crazy stuff. But see, I, and I read that scripture and I thought, blessed is the man, I want to be blessed. Who makes the Lord his trust? I've got to make the Lord. The way I make the Lord my trust is by my thoughts are constantly on him. He's the standard of the image that I hold. If he says it, it's true for me. If he says I have it, I have it. If he says that I can stand in front of thousands of people and preach on a stage and that makes me want to shake in my shoes, then I can do it. If he says that I have boldness, I have boldness. And I say it before I see it. I say it so I see it. Me, I don't think he'll mind me sharing this. Me and Brother Ralph were together yesterday doing a little bit of work, and he shared with me about the scripture that um, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your strength. And he said, you don't mind if I share this, do you? Okay. I just want to... <laughs> and he said that um, he, he wouldn't say that scripture because he didn't feel like it was true. And he's like, well, I don't feel like it's true, so you know, I, I, I didn't say that scripture. And he said he got to talking to Pastor Eddie, and Pastor Eddie said, well, it won't be true until you say it. And, then he, and when Brother Ralph said that, I thought, yeah, because you're activating it yeah. when you're seeing it. I don't know why I see it as like somebody cranking something and it's activating it. The cogs are starting to turn. Yeah. While I'm saying it, it's like that crank's getting turned and things are starting to move. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the power. Stop waiting to see something before you think it's true. Yeah. 
Stop saying, well, the reason I think this way is because that's how everything is around me. We'll think something differently. And I double-dog dare you to see if something else starts popping up. And I don't mean, well, I tried it for 24 hours. I mean, do it, do it, do it, yeah. do it. Do it. Do it till you see it. Do you think I'm a liar? I hope you don't think I'm a liar. Do you think God's a liar? <laughs> and so we've got to think these things. We've got to change the way that we're thinking. A lot of people that are shy... And it seems so hard to get up in front of people or that way because of thoughts they have. Right. You know, is, and uh, I don't want to embarrass her. Is Taryn in here? Okay, good. I'll use her as an example. I was hoping she would. I had been looking around. I am so proud of Taryn. I'm proud of all of my So to Please don't get like, oh, he didn't mention me. I'm so, I love all of you. But this strictly, I just, I had been wanting to say this actually. <coughs> In the youth, but I didn't want to embarrass her, so I never said it. But I'm so proud of Taryn because um, most of y'all probably have known Taryn longer than me, but I've long, known her long enough when she was in the Faith Kids and just a little girl, and she was as shy as, as shy God. I mean, to the point, hey, Taryn, and, you know, and it did not, no eye contact. And I'd hear Chelsea, somebody said, hey, do you? Hey, or like a little, you know, little. and she's, I'm telling you, I've watched her just develop over the years. And now I was, we were sitting back there, uh, I think it was the last night of camp meeting, and I was watching her hold a full-on conversation with an adult, and I was like, wow. <laughs> and I don't mean that towards, I don't, I mean, but, but that's something that, that didn't happen. I mean, I remember the first time, <laughs> first time that Taryn actually spoke to me, I was sort of just kind of like, oh, she speaks. I was like, that's what her voice sounds like. Oh, okay. That's kind of neat. I wish I would have recorded it. Nobody's going to believe me. You know, on a, but I, but it's, I guarantee you that Taryn had to undergo some different thinking for that development to change. She had to be willing to be stretched and get uncomfortable for that development to change. You can't say, well, I'm just so shy and I... You know, I can't be a part of this team in the church and this team in the church because I don't know how to talk to people. Well, start talking to people. If it's awkward, then who cares? You know, it'll get better. I mean, can I be honest with y'all? Everybody probably has thoughts, maybe except Pastor Eddie. I'm, you know, I used to, when I would be preaching in the youth, and this has been, and I, you know, I've been a youth leader since 2014, and I remember preaching in the youth, and I would go home, and have, so, have a hard time going to sleep between two things. One, because it was like my energy was pumping from preaching. And then the second one was I was basically preaching my message round about, almost like I was grading myself, like, well, you had an awkward pause and had to look down at your notes. You know, it's a, and then, you know what I mean? And like, I, so just, you know, I kind of forgot where I was going with this, but you have to re just relax. Relax, change your things, stop beating yourself up, stop... You know, get rid of those thoughts of being awkward. If you're awkward, guess what? The Bible says that we are a peculiar people. So I'm fulfilling Scripture. And I'm fulfilling Scripture at the end of the day. Amen. All right. Well, I said you guys were going to be getting out, so let me, let me close up here. In that, in that Scripture there, Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. That word mind. Do you remember Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 5, that word imagination, yetz, yetzer, mind frame, that word mind, same Hebrew word, yetzer, mind frame. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind frame is stayed on you. Why? Because your mind frame is on the image of the giver of peace, on everything of peace. Therefore, you'll replicate peace. You're sowing seeds of peace. You're getting peace. Amen? That's why. Amen. It says, and I just said, you know, like I said earlier, remind yourself of the victories. Remind yourself of those victories. Amen. Sow those seeds of, well, God did it back here. He's the same God. He'll do it again. Amen. He'll do it again. This is just another opportunity for me to see how big God is. Because when I face something that just seems far greater than me, far bigger than what I am and who I am, then I get to see how big God is. Amen. Because he's got to show up on the scenes or else I'll fail. And if I'm in faith, I can't fail. Because if I'm truly in faith and I fail, then there's a conversation that needs to happen. And I don't even want to dare go down that route because that's not... So, <laughs> you will keep him in perfect peace who's minus on you. That word peace, shalom. So God will keep you in whatever applies to shalom. Well-being, 
health, happiness, peace, everything, prosperity. God will keep you in that because your mind frame is centered on that. Let's close with some. I want to get you guys to, to, to declare some things before I release you. I want you to repeat after me. Say, I have authority, I have authority over my mind, over my, mind over, my thoughts, over my thoughts, and I take authority, and I take authority over my mind, over my mind and, over my and over my thoughts. Lord, show me, Lord, show me in the coming week the, coming the, things, the things that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about. The, Lord the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. I shall not lack. I shall not lack for finances. I shall not lack for joy. I shall not lack for peace. And I shall not lack for health. Uh, let's give the Lord a shout. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We worship you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord. You are our source, our only source, and we trust in you. We don't look to man. We don't look to things, but we keep our minds focused on you, and you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. That is us, Father. Our minds are stayed on you. We praise you, and we worship you in your holy name. Amen.